You may be seated. If you have a Bible, Acts chapter 7. Uh, Acts chapter 7, if you have a Bible. Uh, we're going to finish Acts 7 today and then look at the first four verses of chapter 8 uh, together. And we've been looking at the testimony of Stephen. We've been looking at the faithfulness of, C- of Stephen. And I don't know about you, but the first few chapters of Acts are really inspiring, right? I and mean, when you think about it, faithfulness despite opposition, faithfulness despite pressure is inspiring, We think of people like Elizabeth Elliot, whose husband Jim was killed by the tribe and whom he was trying to minister to. And what happened to Elizabeth? She went in and she went to minister to them. She didn't abandon them. She went to live with them. We read about the persecuted church in our day, churches in all across the country. And what what happens, they're persecuted for the sake of the gospel, but they continue on. And it inspires us. It is truly inspiring because there's something unique about pressure. There's something unique about pressure. Pressure has broken people. Pressure has proven people. I mean, you think about it. We define so many things by people's ability to handle pressure. We define athletes by their ability to handle pressure. Like, did they choke? Did, were they clutch? Like, that defines them. We define our friendships by the support during pressure. Like, were they there for me? Am I going to be there for them? Well, were they there for me in the pressure times of my life? The fact is, we learn a ton about people when they face pressure, when they face difficulties, when they face hard times. And the question this morning is this, when you're pressed, what freely flows? When you're pressed, what is exposed? They say that pressure is what transforms a lump of coal into a diamond, and it's pressure that often defines Christians. And so when we're pressed, what is exposed? I remember in college, I would come back on breaks in college, and if you know my testimony wasn't the best type of person before college, and I went to Bible college, and I was trying to live right, I was trying to live for God, and it seemed like every semester, like I'd take giant strides for faith, giant strides for my relationship with God, until I went to a break. It was like I came home, and I came with full expectations to keep my courage, to keep my faith, to keep everything going in the right, right direction, training for ministry. And it seemed like every break, I would come home and it would just, just take a couple days for my friends to kind of pressure me back into different, different things. And I'd say no for it. It's like, no, man, I'm not doing that. I don't do that anymore. I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm just trained to be a preacher. And it's like just a couple days, like, oh, yeah, I forgot. You're a Christian. Oh, Travis is trained to be the preacher man. I forgot. And it was like just a couple days and then I'd, I'd engage and they're like, there, there's our Travis. Like there's, there's our guy. There's our friend. And I always felt so defeated. Like when I was pressed, Christ did not come out of me. And so the question for us this morning is when we're pressed, what is exposed? Because when Stephen's pressed, what we see is that Christ comes out of him. That he looks a whole lot like Jesus. The fact is faithfulness will come with pressure. Faithfulness in our life will come with a whole lot of pressure in anything. Your faithfulness to your job will come with a whole lot of pressure to not wiggle the numbers or not take the other job. Your faithfulness to your spouse will come with a whole lot of pressure to not put yourself first and honor the commitment that you made before God. Your, the pressure, uh, you'll be pressed in this church, the pressure to divide over minor differences and to in your Christian faith is what we see with the life of Stephen is you will be pressed, but what is it that is exposed? And so we're going to look at Acts chapter 7 and see the final results of Stephen's life and see a couple characteristics of faithfulness and what faithfulness will entail in our life. And so if you have your Bibles open, Acts 7 verse 54 says this, And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. What thing? Stephen just declares a beautiful message that we saw last week. And so after they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed their teeth with him, at him. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazes unto heaven and he saw the glory of God. And Jesus was standing at the right hand of God. And Stephen said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and they ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. 
And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of the young man named Saul, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And so this morning, I want to see a couple things that results from faithfulness. The first thing is this, faithfulness to God will not be spoiled. Faithfulness to God will not be spoiled. Your faithfulness and my faithfulness to God will not be in vain, that we can be faithful. Stephen understood that his greatest calling in his life was to magnify Jesus. We see this in his life. His greatest calling was to make much of Jesus. He didn't back down. Remember that 20, 71 people, the group of Sanhedrin, 72 with the high priest, they were all there and he doesn't back down. What's he say? He, he speaks with clarity. He speaks with courage. He knows his calling, but he also knew his greatest reward in life was to be in the presence of the Lord. Like that was his greatest reward. His greatest calling was to make much of Jesus, but his greatest reward was to be in the presence of Jesus because he understood that faithfulness would not be spoiled. Paul said it this way, for to me to live is Christ and to die is simply gain. And for me to live is Christ and to die is a gain. This is the lifestyle that Stephen lived. And Stephen didn't just live it in his speech. Stephen ju didn't just live it in his courage. Stephen lived it in his endurance to suffer for the sake of the gospel, even till the end, because he knew faithfulness would not be spoiled. That Stephen came to a, uh, came to a perspective that said, I'm, in on Je I'm all in on Jesus. I'm all in on Jesus. I'm team Jesus all the way. And we see it with the way that he lived his life because he knew the Sanhedrin could not stop the mission from continuing. That's the whole message series that we've been on. The mission continues through the people of God doing the work of God for the glory of God with other people of God. We've seen this story play out and he knew what Jesus promised would prevail, that, that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But he also knew his calling, Acts 1.8. Remember that? It says it this way. You're going to be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Like he knew nothing could stop the mission of God from continuing. And so he was devoting to it. And so what Stephen received, salvation. And what he was called to, to go. And what he's appointed to, to serve, to be a deacon, changed everything. And left Stephen with one option, I'm all in for Jesus. I'm all in. And that changed. He was, he was devoting to faithfulness in, in, a, in a magnificent, magnificent way. You remember whenever you were in dating relationships? Some of you are still there. Some of you are, uh, are past it. Some of you are about to enter it. Some of you are trying, just waiting, uh, right? Uh, and, and you remember in dating relationships, though, you would reach a point in your dating relationships where you would have to ask yourself a few questions, and they seem like really selfish questions. And the questions were like, do I really want to commit to this relationship? Do I really want to continue? Do I really want to take this relationship to the next level? Do I really want to put this person above myself? And I'll be honest, this is where a lot of my relationships ended because I was not willing to put people above me until I met this girl, now my wife, and things were a little different. Right? I, I knew right away it took several months to convince her to put me before her. Right? Uh, it took several months to convince, but uh, what, what, takes, what took place? There, there resulted in, in an evaluation, a personal evaluation that resulted in a devotion, that resulted into a sacrifice, that resulted into a commitment to say, hey, we're all in. And that was a commitment ultimately we made before God and a covenant before God and, and before our loved ones on a wedding altar that we said we are all in on this until death do us part. And in the same way, Stephen was all in on Jesus where he says there's no other option because faithfulness will not be spoiled. And the reality is this morning, I feel like there's a lot of Christians who aren't all in for Jesus because they see being all in for Jesus is optional. And, and for Stephen, there was no option. Christ was the only option. Devotion to Christ, faithfulness to Jesus Christ was the only option. And so whatever the obstacles were, whatever the challenge was, whatever the hurdle was that he had to cross, he was all in on Jesus. And so Stephen, we see it in the, in the message that he preaches. We saw it last week. Stephen preaches this 
awesome, uh, historical, gospel-centered message. And, and we know the response, verse 54. This is what the Sanhedrin did. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. We talked about that last week. And they gnashed their teeth at him. This word gnashing of teeth uh, is mentioned seven times in the New Testament. And it's either mentioned towards a, a, a consequence of hell or a rejection of Jesus. By the way, those who gnash their teeth at Jesus and reject Jesus will ultimately, the Bible says, have their place in the lake of fire, which is hell. And there, the Bible says, they'll be welling and gnashing of teeth forever. That hell is a real place. Hell is a place of torment, misery. You don't want to go there. And the Bible says, because of our depravity, that's where we're headed. And those who willfully reject God's free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ will have their part. That for all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And part of that is that we fall short. The wages of our sin is death, which means the wages of our sin is eternal separation of God. Will there be welling and gnashing of teeth forever in a place called hell? But in God's mercy and in God's grace, he offers us a way of escape because he says, but the gift of God is eternal life. Oh, awesome. How do I escape this welling of gnashing of teeth? It's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the Bible says, if we claim him, if we repent of our sins, we turn from our sins and turn to Jesus, then we, in fact, can be forgiven and we can be saved. That we don't have to have this welling of gnashing of teeth. And so what we see is that they reject Jesus, but they're ultimately assuming the role of rejecting him one day. And so what a sad day this is. Really, it's a sad day for Stephen, but what a sad day for the life of the Sanhedrin. That they were cut to the heart. They see, the, they felt the conviction of God, but they are moved to cover their ears and cease the gospel from speaking. It's a sad day because what we find is that the next verse says, they cried with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and they ran at him. When they couldn't find the words to rebuttal him, they go to find stones to kill him. It's a sad day when they stop the gospel from continuing. But just before they grab Stephen, verse 55 says that Stephen looks up and he says this, he being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed unto heaven and he saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open. I see the son of man standing at the right hand of the throne of God in the midst of Stephen's final moments. His faithfulness would not be spoiled because of where his focus lied. His faithfulness would not be spoiled because of who had his focus and where his focus was directed. Because we can look at this and we're like, man, how can he do this? Like Sanhedrin coming at him. He's already heard about this happening with Jesus. Like run, dude. Like go. Like find a way out. Throw some punches. Do whatever. Don't go down easy. Like get out of there. But, but he stood with faithfulness. How? Well, the Bible says he being full of the Holy Spirit that he was sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And the reality is we get so worked up about so many different things in life, don't we? We get so worked up about, I mean, we can get, we can lose our testimony if someone keeps their brights on when they pass us at night. Like we just like hate things in life and we are so easily moved out of the spirit of God. And Stephen, even in the midst of the final moments of his life, as the stones were approaching him, he being full of the spirit, he being full of the Spirit, it's an amazing aspect that he, he uh, talks about. And I want you to notice the context of it. It says he being full of the Holy Spirit. This is present active tense. This is not a miraculous moment where God's like, hey, Stephen, you're going to need a little bit extra anointing right now, a little bit extra something so you don't feel these stones about to hit, hit you. No, this is he being full. Of the, this is the way that he lived. This is the way that Stephen lived his life. Remember what being full of the Spirit means. It means to be under the control of the Spirit, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And Stephen lived this every day. He yielded to the leading of the Holy Spirit day by day. And the results was this. The results was that the fruit of the Spirit began to expose in his life. You know the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5 says uh, this way, but the fruits of the Spirit uh, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, uh, self-control. Against such there is no law. That the filling of the Spirit resulted in the fruits of the Spirit flowing through Stephen's life. And so the question is this, when we're pressed, do the fruits of the Spirit be freely exposed through us? 
I mean, we, we're, we're pressed when someone uh, cuts us off in traffic, when our spouse says something that we don't like, when our uh, boss makes us work a little overtime, or there's a little conflict at home, or whatever it may be, what is exposed? Because when Stephen is pressed, what we see is the fruits of the Spirit begin to be exposed in his life. And, and here, here it is, it's going to play a factor. It's going to play a massive role in the spread of the church, but also the conversion of Saul, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. Like it's going to play a role because of how he responded to pressure around him. And so when you're pressed, does anger and frustration flow from you or does love and peace flow from you? When you're pressed, does bitterness and hatred bear in your bones or does long suffering and kindness have control? When you're pressed, does faithfulness take root or do you try to take your own reins? Like when you're really being pressed, what type of things come through your veins? Like what takes place in your life? Because when Stephen's pressed, he looks a whole lot like Jesus. And so what about us? One time in youth ministry, I had a larger youth ministry that I led, and so uh, we would have services much like this, but pre-service, um, and se- we would play a lot of stage games. And so one of the stage games I played was the caramel apple challenge, is what we call it, a real clever name. But we had four caramel apples up here on tables, and so I said, hey, I need four volunteers. A first one to eat a caramel apple gets a gift card. And, you know, students, I, was, I raised my hand. I love caramel apples. They were like, pick me, pick me, pick me. And so we picked four students. They came up here. Little did they know that everybody's getting a gift card because it's about to be real entertaining for the crowd because they thought they were about to eat caramel apples. But what we actually did was we put caramel around onions. And so as they took a bite, yeah, I thought about doing it today, but I didn't want anyone to leave the church. So, uh it was, a, it was a beautiful, it was an awesome game. I enjoyed it. I mean, it, it stunk up the whole room. And, and they, they were faithful. I mean, they were, ch- teens will do anything. I mean, they're chowing down on this onion, crying. Uh, one guy over there, junior high, just licking the caramel off. Like he's content losing, but he's going to take that caramel down. Uh, what happened? What they thought was on the outside was not what was on the inside. And, and, and so here's the question. You can say you're a Christian. You can say you follow Jesus. But when you're pressed, what's exposed? Because when Stephen's pressed, he looks a whole lot like Jesus. So much so, these guys are attacking him. These guys are coming at him with rage. And what's he do? He looks up to heaven, the Bible says. And he, being full of the Holy Spirit, look, gazes into heaven. He sees Jesus. And what's Jesus doing? He's standing at the right hand of the throne of God. Why is he standing? He's standing to, because uh, he's activated to help his own. He's standing to welcome his own. He knows what's about to take place. He's standing in approval. He's standing saying, hey, he's mine. He's my servant in whom I am well pleased. Someone once said it this way, that in the moment of pressure, God relieved the horror of a stone with a glimpse of heaven which resulted in joy that his current suffering couldn't be compared to the glory to come. Why? Because faithfulness will not be spoiled. Secondly, I want you to see this. Faithfulness to God will be attacked. Faithfulness to God will not be spoiled, but it will also be attacked. Look at verse 57. They cried with a loud voice, and they stopped their ears, and they ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of the young man named Saul, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. First of all, I want you to notice faithfulness is attacked. Stephen's faithfulness caused the enemy to be on attack. Why? Remember what he just claimed. What do you say? Jesus is standing at the right hand of the throne of God. Like that's a, that's a no-no in Judaism. Like they're ticked off in this moment. They were vexed at him preaching Jesus, but they're moved to violence when he says this claim. Because whoever's standing at the right hand of the throne of God, the psalmist will tell us, has the power and authority over their enemies. Whoever's standing at the right hand of God has equal position to God, has equal honor to God, has equal command to God, has equal authority with God, and they are moved to violence because of this claim. Remember, this was the final straw they had with Jesus too in in Matthew 26. When Jesus stood before the same group of people and Jesus says this, I say to you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. What's that? The right hand of the throne of God. He's going to come on the clouds of heaven. And then what happened? The high priest ripped his robe 
And he says, that's blasphemy. And he asks, well, what do you think should be done with him? We don't even need any witnesses. He just spoke blasphemy before us. And the Sanhedrin are like, we need to kill him. And just as they take Stephen, uh, just as they took Jesus to Calvary, they take Stephen to a cliff. In the, in the Mishnah, which is Jewish law, a blasphemer would have to be taken outside the city. And so they follow the law. They take him outside the city. After that, a blasphemer would be placed on something at least twice his height, dropped to his knees, facing the cliff. And an accuser, at least one of the accusers, had to be present. And the accuser had to push him off the cliff hopefully to hit his head. After that, if he didn't die there, uh, the other accuser, so there'd have to be at least two accusations against him, the other accuser would take a large stone and push it towards his heart off the cliff, hopefully hitting his heart or head. And that's how, and if he, if he survived that or they missed that, they'd pick him up and they'd cast stones at him with the crowd. We don't know if Stephen was done that way. That was according to Jewish law. All the Bible tells us is that they took him outside the city. And so we assume they followed that code. But either way, this is what takes place. Stephen's outside the city and he's stoned. And really it's a sad day because the people who stone Stephen think they're doing a service to God. You know that? Like we think about Stephen, like he's faithful. These guys think they're being faithful. These guys are following the letter of the law. These guys are following the code and they're, they're, they're on attack because they thought they were being faithful to the law, but they, mis, they were misled by the law. And they missed the fulfillment of the law, which was ultimately Jesus. But they're trying to be faithful. But in this moment, so is Stephen. And what flowed through Stephen left, left a lasting impact for the gospel that very day. As he says, Lord Jesus, as he just lets them take him, Lord, forgive them, he'll say in just a few moments. And, and here's why I say that. This is why it's so important for us as believers to daily walk in the spirit of God. Because we have no clue the power of the impact of the different circumstances that we face in our life. We have no clue the power and the impact that, that our, we give to our kids as, as we respond in the fruits of the Spirit to our spouse instead of rage to our spouse. We have no clue the power and the impact that we respond to our coworkers and the fruits of the Spirit instead of, instead of the flesh. We have no clue the power of our impact because God will use this moment as a seed to not only expand the church but to convert Saul into Paul. And so here's the reality that we see our lifestyle for Christ, our courage for Christ, and our voice to make much of Christ uh, will result in some sort of attack. Hopefully not physically, maybe just a uh, temptation, maybe just the devil's personally attacking us. It will result in attack, but if we submit to him, if we yield to him, if we follow his spirit and display the fruits of the spirit through our life, God will get the glory. And that's exactly what we see in this text. Someone once said it this way, the blood of the martyrs are a seed to the church. And we're here today because of thousands before us that, that left it all and gave it all so that we could continue and God's word could, could flourish and to continue. And this is why we are, we are here. And so uh, we said at Easter, we said at Easter, you may die with a lie, but you will not die for a lie. Right? You just won't. You will not die for a joke. You will not die for a conspiracy. I, I think about it. A popular uh, one that I was looking up this week is, is many, I don't know about many, but some believe Elvis is still alive. All right? Whether you do or not, some believe Tupac is still alive. Uh, now, you may believe that. I, let, me hear, let me hear it. It would be interesting. You may believe that, but even if you think you could prove it, you're not going to die for it. It would be silly to die for that lie, to die for that conspiracy. Whether they're alive or not, it would be silly to do it. But here's the thing. The early church gave their lives. They were dismembered for the claim that Jesus Christ is risen. This is the evidence of it. Faithful martyrs are an evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, a first century a Roman historian, a first century Roman historian actually wrote this about martyrs in that day. He says it this way, in their deaths, they were made subjects to sport. They were wrapped in hides of wild beasts. They were torn to pieces by dogs. In the day, they were nailed to crosses and set on fire. And when the night declined, they were burned to serve as a prey of light. In present day, more Christians are martyred in Nigeria than any country in the world. In fact, it is illegal in 42 countries to convert someone to Christianity today. 
42 countries that are legal to do, not only do what we're doing here, but to proclaim him to just an individual at a coffee shop in 42 countries in the world. Here's the point. Faithfulness is on attack. Faithfulness will be on attack. And I'm thankful that our faithfulness may not result in death. But my question this morning is, are we faithful with our freedoms? Are you even faithful with your freedoms? Are you faithful to devote and dive into the Bible that you hold in your hands that many have gave their life for just to hold? Are you faithful to have a gospel conversation with someone at the coffee shop and you're not threat of death, you're just threat of an awkward conversation? Are you faithful to upheed and uphold the the commitments that you've made to God over the years, the commitments that you made to your spouse over the years, the commitment that you made to your church over the years? Are, are Are we faithful with the freedoms that we have? I'm not asking if if we're willing to die for Jesus. I'm asking, are we willing to live for him? Are Are we willing to be faithful to him? Because faithfulness will be on attack. The second thing we see is this, Saul's on attack. The Bible says this, these witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And so here it is, we're introduced to this guy by the name of Saul. This word young man means man in his prime. He's a man in his prime, he's ready to go. We know that Saul was likely a member of the synagogue of freedmen who have accused Stephen. Uh, Acts 22.3 will tell us he was trained by Gamaliel. Uh, and, and that meant he was well-versed in Old Testament law and rabbi traditions. And for some reason, he was the guy picked to cause havoc on the church. Look at Acts 8 verse 1, it says this. Now Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. And at that time, great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. But for Saul, he made havoc on the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. And we see the death of Stephen resulted in a wicked pursuit to take out the church. That this word made havoc means, uh, this word made havoc means this. It refers to destroying a city. It refers to uh, being mangled by a wild animal. That Saul's goal and, and Jerusalem's goal was to completely demolish the church. And they do all efforts to do just that. So much so that people have to get out of there. But Saul did a lot of evil. But, but that day with Stephen is something that he never forgot. Because if you go to Acts 22, verse 19, the Bible says this in Acts 22, 19. Saul says, so I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I've imprisoned and I beat those who believe on you. He's like, everywhere I went, I imprisoned people, I beat people for their claim to Jesus. But then he mentions one person's name. But he says it this way, but the blood of your martyr, Stephen, when I shed that, I also was standing by the, I was also standing by consenting to his death. I was approving it all. And I was guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Saul says, I've done a whole lot of evil. <laughs> but there was something about that day with Stephen. I've done a whole lot of wrong, but I can't get Stephen out of my head. Why? Because I believe Stephen planted a seed of the gospel that day. Because of what was, ex- when he was pressed, what was exposed left a mark on the life of Saul and eventually played a role in his conversion. Someone once said this, we owe, we owe Paul to the prayer of Stephen. Because when Stephen's pressed, Christ comes out. And so here's the reality. Faithfulness will not be spoiled. Faithfulness will be attacked. But if we stay faithful, God can get the glory. And the last thing is this, a faithfulness is a willingness to go. Faithfulness to God is a willingness to go. Look at verse 60. The Bible says this, And Stephen knelt down, and he cried with a loud voice and said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Early Christians liked to, did not like the word death, and so they instead, many times in the New Testament, they, were the, they used the word falling asleep. Why? Because to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. The the body stays, the spirit goes up. And so they didn't like the word death. It's too harsh of a word. And so they said falling asleep. But the focus is not that. The focus is that Stephen lived in the same way that he died, sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. And in God's sense, and in his sensitivity to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God, he says, Lord, have mercy on those who slay me. Have mercy on the very ones who took me out. It's a similar word that Jesus said, right? Father, forgive them on the cross, for they know not what they do. And Stephen's words will come true in just a few chapters. 
Why? Because on the way to Damascus, Saul will meet Jesus. And here's the thing about it. The early church would have a great problem with it. (laughs) They struggled with it. They, They really did. In fact, after Saul's first sermon in the synagogue, this is what the Christians had to say about it. They said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on Jesus at Jerusalem and came to do the same thing to us? Like, hold up a second. He's preaching Jesus now, but he, he, I don't know about this guy. Like, let's hold up. Let's make sure that he goes through the hurdles to, to I don't know if he's like just playing the game to try to get us and attack us some more. Hold up a second. And here's the reality. Faithfulness to God is a willingness to go, but faithfulness to God is also the willingness to let go. Faithfulness of God is the willingness to go, but it's also the faithfulness to let go. You know what biblical forgiveness is? Here's what biblical forgiveness is. It's forward giving. It's forward giving. It's saying, I cannot control this, Lord. If I continue to hold this, Lord, I'm going to act in anger. I'm going to act in resent. I'm not going to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to kind of take advantage. I'm never going to trust them again. I'm going to want justice too much. So, Lord, I'm forward giving it to you. It's not, you're saying, I forgive them. I'm taking it out of my hands. Lord, if you want mercy for them, your will be done. If you want forgiveness and grace, your will be done. If you want justice, your will be done. I'm forward giving it to you. And that's the character that Stephen lived. And you know what happens when Stephen continues to walk by faithfulness, even in his death, God multiplies his church. God multiplies his church because there was a call in Acts 1.8 that the church is pretty faithful, they're, they're pretty together, we've talked about it, but they still yet were not doing what God had called them to do. What had God called them to do? To go. You're gonna be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world, and they're staying in Jerusalem. And so God uses a martyr to plant a seed of the gospel in the life of Saul, but, but to also cause the church to do what God has called the church to do. That God got the glory with the life of Stephen. And in Stephen's prayer, what we see is that the life, uh, the life of Stephen was evident of the life of Christ. Faithfulness is the willingness to go. Faithfulness is the willingness to let go. Because in verse 4 in Acts chapter 8, the Bible says this, And therefore those who were scattered, what did they do? They went in hiding? No. They just went and way far away from Rome and just like, let's cool off for a minute. Let's take a breather. Let's evaluate a strategy. No, they went everywhere preaching the word. Oh, hold up. Like, Stephen, you just got killed. We've been forced to scatter. This crazy guy, Saul, he's on attack. Jerusalem, Sanhedrin, they're trying to make posses and all these things to take us out. And they scatter and they can't help but preach Jesus. They can't help but continue to do that which they're called to do. Despite pressure, despite threats of of death, they preach Christ. It's an amazing thing. And so the application is this, when you're pressed, well, it's exposed. I'm not asking if we're willing to die for Jesus. I'm asking, are we living for him? Are we following him day by day? Would you pray with me? As we prepare to pray, Stephen could die that day because he was confident that he'd be with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Stephen could die because he was confident that he could be with Jesus. Let me ask you, how confident are you that you'd be with Jesus? If you were to die today, how confident are you that Jesus is your Lord? The Bible says you can be. The Bible says that Jesus has come and that in our sin, We have fallen short, but that you can know Jesus. You have eternal life. You can have security of salvation if you just claim him. If you just repent of your sins, acknowledge him as Savior, and turn to him by faith and make him your Lord, he can save you. Not of your works, but completely of his. And so if you don't know Jesus, would you follow him today? If you know him, may may he freely flow. We're going to sing, and then we're going to have a couple baptisms. And I'm excited. They're going to be led by Pastor Brad. And baptism is a picture of what Christ has done for us in our obedience to him. And so we're going to symbolize that. And if you don't know Jesus, this is a picture of what he's done for you, that, that his death, his burial, and his resurrection. 
And as someone's baptized, it does not save them. It's simply a rep, a, a, really a picture of what Christ has done and saying, hey, I want to follow him with my life. And so we have three that wanna do that. One thing that I think is special is that we like to involve those who have impact on their lives. And so there'll be a few ladies in there that, that have helped uh, disciple and train up these girls. And they're gonna participate with us this morning. But let's pray. If you don't know Jesus, I'd love to talk to you. If you know him, let's let him flow. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this church. Lord, I thank you that you've given us your word and that you've allowed us and allotted us an opportunity to follow you. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us do that this week. Lord, there's a whole lot of problems. There's a whole lot of frustrations. In my life, I know in the life of this room, that the devil just wants to tempt us to act in the flesh, act in the flesh, act in the flesh. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us this week, just days at a time, to act in the spirit. May we cling to your spirit, may we follow you, submit to you, and honor you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray.